Today we are in southeast Brazil in the rainforest, a place of biodiversity, a haven for wildlife. During the day it is a spectacle of animals of all shapes, colors and sizes, some of them rarely photographed or hardly documented, and each of them are trying to survive in their own way theater of variety and diversity. But once the sun sets, things become a free-for-all for everyone. Predators roam the forest, the swamps, the rivers. In absence of light, all sorts of animals come out of their hiding place, doing things that are forbidden in broad daylight. However, in the complete darkness, there is one animal that comes out at night and it has above all managed to intrigue me. The black witch moth. Many people are afraid of them, for they are associated with black magic and bad luck. It is said that they are an omen of death or disease, or are the souls of relatives who passed away. They are even capable of cursing people. Very little is known about them and their biology. In particular, their life cycle. Some people have photographed the caterpillars before in the wild, or even documented the food plants. But these people have done poor attempts at documenting them. Some people have done attempts at rearing them in captivity too. But it seems all the records of people raising them in captivity are very poor, with low quality pictures and information. The truth is, the complete life cycle of this insect is mostly unknown. We don't really understand their full life cycle, all their early life stages at all. Nor is there any adequate documentation or even pictures to illustrate the life history. And that is a problem. The simple truth is they are poorly understood and researched and have barely been investigated. If somebody would manage to raise them in captivity and properly document it, it would help their conservation and unlock new understanding of this species in general. In a lot of ways, these insects are a mystery to science. A mystery I'm about to solve. And this is a problem. The fact that the life cycle of the black witch moth is so poorly understood to science it bothers me, because this species is super widespread, okay? It's pretty much a resident from the southern United States, while well, it can migrate even up to Canada, but it's resident from like Florida, Texas, all the way down to Central America, places like Mexico, all the way down to the Amazon rainforest, all the way down to the Atlantic rainforest in Paraguay, Argentina, uh, Southeast Brazil, and I'm like, this species is so common and widespread. It must have such a massive impact on the environment, guys. These moths are some of the most common large species that are present in many tropical American or subtropical forest ecosystems. And I just don't understand why aren't there any studies on its life cycle? This species must have such a big ecological footprint. There are dozens of countries where it's extremely widespread, commonly eaten by a range of predators like bats and birds. Just imagine the large surface this insect is doing to the environment, just for insectivores alone. How could nobody have investigated this so I guys have done something really, really bold? I have applied for funding to finally resolve this little scientific problem. A fund grant is basically an application to receive money for an entomological project. Now guys, I have done something really, really bold. I sent a message to a natural reserve in southeastern Brazil, it is called Regua. Reserva Ecológica de Guapiatsu. And I told them straight up, I want to stay for free in Regua for three to six months. I want flight tickets to Brazil. 
I need a laboratory and a butterfly house. And we're gonna see the response. Oh God. Yeah, it's happening guys. I knew it. I knew it, guys. Oh my God. Did you not realize what just happened? Ten thousands of dollars were just invested in me as an entomologist, okay? I'm getting my own research house in Brazil for six months. The natural reserve is going to provide food, cooking, cleaning, and a laboratory, and they are going to build a butterfly house, a small sp flight space just for me, so that I can try to breed the black witch. We, my friends, are going to Brazil. Oh yeah! And our mission is to try and breed the black witch moth in captivity, and finally, finally document all the life stages of this mysterious and misunderstood insect. I never felt so much pressure before to succeed with a breeding project. Because if I fail, people have bought me flight tickets for nothing. <sighs> Let's get started. I just got a message. The people in Brazil are already making preparations, guys. They are growing dozens of saplings of the food plants of this moth in a tree nursery. Oh, this is going to be so good. This is Bart Coppens, and welcome to the most legendary episode of Moth Cycles ever. A rearing project in which many people are invested. I hope I succeed. This is the time to start the intro. Welcome to Moth Cycles, the Black Witch Moth.
Ladies and gentlemen, I have traveled to Brazil to join a conservation project named Regua. I will be studying butterflies and moths here as a researcher. I even have my own research accommodation here. But one of the moths in this forest that you really, really want to have to see is a giant that doesn't easily reveal itself. It is the Black Witch. Superstitious people are even afraid of it, saying that its appearance is perhaps a bad omen. So, how do we see this Black Witch? Well, there are several ways that we can use to attract moths, such as using a light trap at night. However, the Black Witch is often not fooled by artificial light. In fact, this species is notorious for rarely coming to any moth trap. But they do have a soft spot for rotting fermenting fruit. You see, this, these very large moths have a proboscis and need to eat a lot of food to sustain their large bodies. And therefore, we've placed some fruit here. It's rotting bananas. Now tonight, I'm going to be watching over these rotting fermenting fruits, which should be perfect food for the black witch. And let's see if we can lure the queen of the jungle with these rotting bananas tonight. Using our infrared cameras, we can observe the feeding train. Be patient guys, it will happen. The Queen of Darkness will shortly arrive. Wait, did something just move? No! Dang it! Not you! Stop eating my bananas! These are for entomological research, you unsophisticated beast. It's okay, we wait and wait and wait. Just be patient. Here they are, ladies and gentlemen, the giant black witch moths are arriving. A common, widespread, yet majestic creature. The moths seem to exclusively feed on rotten fruit. Or at least, they are not interested in flowers or nectar. It's very easy to attract them with fermenting bananas. Our research project is about to start. I do, however, have one issue. Here we have a black witch. As you can see by the white band on her wings, only the females have this band. She's actually a small female. Normally the females are much larger. I am going to be in Brazil for about three months and the life cycle of the black witch takes three months. That's a problem. In order to successfully breed this species, I must find females now, right away, when I just arrived in Brazil. Now, now. If I fail to fa catch females this week or next week, I'm running out of time to raise them before I go back to the Netherlands. Big moths usually take a bit more time. So, uh, I have some peanuts and beer to give, wish me good luck, and uh, of course, a good quality butterfly net essential for any entomologist and I have funding in collaboration with a natural reserve it's called Regua Reserva Ecologica de Guapiatsu 
to study the life cycle of the Black Witch in more detail. And that's what we're going to do. I have one job, one mission. And of course, I'm going to pull it off because I am the sexy moth king himself. Let's get uh, started tonight. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there she is, a female. We have a strong, healthy, perfect looking female. Can you see her? Here drinking from the bananas. There she is. She is very big. She is very healthy and I'm going to catch her. Now if I manage to catch her, this is the beginning of a new Moth Cycles episode. And the beginning of a life cycle that is hardly ever documented by anyone. The Black Witch. Are we going to succeed? Spoiler alert, if this video is on YouTube, that means that I've succeeded, right? You have to be really careful. Approach her from behind. <coughs> no! Did I miss? Hold on. Hello everyone, this is Bart Coppens and welcome in my Brazilian insect breeding laboratory. Today I am going to show you how to breed Ascalafa odorata, also known as the Black Witch. This is a species I've wanted to breed for ages. And some of you people watching may be surprised to see me breeding it. You probably didn't know it was possible. Ha! Robert Coppens makes everything possible when it comes to moths. So, I've been breeding the Black Witch here in my laboratory in the Brazilian rainforest. And it's been going quite well. Sorry for the sounds, there's construction work going on. Oopsie doopsie. But um, here we can see there's two females of the Black Witch. They're quite large, I'll show you a close-up, but more importantly, they've been uh, laying hundreds of eggs. Oh, I have the hiccups. Don't you hate it when you have the hiccups in an intro? So we're going to collect some of the eggs right now and incubate them in a petri dish. The first country where I've managed to establish a rearing laboratory is the country of Brazil. So right now I'm in southeastern Brazil, near Rio de Janeiro, and this is my Insect breeding laboratory sponsored by a natural reserve called Regua, Reserva Ecologica de Guapiatsu, that I work for as an entomologist. So now I have finally have a, a laboratory to breed these insects we're going to get started. And they've laid a lot of eggs. In order to lay a lot of eggs, the females need to feed regularly. Personally, I feed them by giving them a mix of sugar water. It's a solution of about 50-50 water and sugar that are mixed. I'll show you how to make this solution and how to feed them and how to get the females to cooperate in captivity later in this video. But first we need to focus on obtaining some eggs from these incredibly large and mysterious insects. I managed to catch not one, but two different wild females, so that's good news. The trick to getting many eggs is to feed the females often and feed them well. Guys, the eggs of this species are very small. Whoop, whoop, don't fly away. Whew. So the eggs of this species are very small, but if we zoom in, you can see them. They're like, they're like tiny grains of sand. And it's incredible to think that such tiny eggs can grow into such a very large moth, isn't it? Is that not insane? And as you can see, I have figured out how to make them lay eggs. Tip, it has to do with feeding them and making them feel comfortable. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to collect the eggs in a petri dish where they're going to be incubated. So one tip is to shake up the container here a little bit. So if I push it with my finger here, vibrations will collect the eggs in this area. Ah, there we go. That's fantastic. And this is the start of the official Black Witch Moth, Moth Cycles episode. There you go. 
And as you can see, they have been really laying well. That's fantastic. I have more females of the Black Witch here too. Here's another one of them. It's a very big moth. So this mommy has also laid hundreds of eggs. I still have these two individuals. Ah, so that's fantastic. So, hello. Yeah. Don't mind me if I'm talking to the camera. <laughs> now guys, black witch moths, uh, they can live for a long time. If you take care of them well, but how to take care of the imagos, I'll show that later. So right now I'm just collecting the eggs, as you can see. They're very tiny and they've laid hundreds last night. There you go. So don't worry about how to raise the caterpillars or the moths yet. I'll show that at the end. First we're going to raise them. There you go. Well, there you go, folks. These are the eggs of the black witch. And of course, I'm going to be one of the first people to raise it. Of course, I'm not the absolute first, but I'm definitely the first at documenting it properly. Because I haven't seen any care sheet or guide of how to raise this species. And the thing about me is I like being the first because I have a lot of vanity and ego. Just kidding. But it justifies doing it more for research also. Of course, the life cycle of this insect is known to science. It's a quite common insect, but at the same time, larvae are rarely photographed and filmed because they live very hidden lives. And we'll I'll to show you more about that later once they really turn into the caterpillars. Wow. That's a lot of eggs just for the first day. So now we're going to wait. So the eggs of this species, they hatch in only about five days, yeah, or less. So that's why you hardly see them in the hobby. The eggs hatch usually too fast for shipping or transport. In about five days, we'll have babies. So we're going to label it 18 November. Scalafa, odorata, yeah, not very readable, but readable enough for me. Like a good science dear scientist. Well, I don't have a degree actually, so maybe I don't, shouldn't call myself a scientist. Like a good researcher. I like to label my stuff. Here's uh, another Brazilian silk moth, but that's for another video. Adela nevaya subangulata. This female has also laid a lot of eggs, but again, that's a different species. I'm researching the life cycles of Brazilian moths in this uh, laboratory right here. So it's a good start for the black witch. Five days went by until I saw something move in the petri dishes. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an emergency, but it's a beautiful emergency. You see? The black witch moths are hatching the babies. Ooh, we did it. But we have a long way to go. The most difficult part about breeding the, <clears throat> the black witch is rearing the caterpillars. And there is a reason that very few people have ever raised this species. That's because the caterpillars are actually very sensitive to stress, very sensitive to disturbance, and they need a day and night rhythm. So they, need, they feed in darkness and they don't like artificial light. In fact, if you keep them indoors in a room with too much artificial light, they can starve. So, let me show you the babies first. Wow! Babies have been born. Can you believe it? What's even crazier is that the eggs have hatched in about five days time. That's less than a week, a very fast development time. Now the babies are very sensitive to stress and they can run very fast. And I'm going to be honest with you, their survival rate is probably going to be low. Why? Because these insects are very hard to raise. I'm one of the few only people who is attempting to raise them so there are no care sheets and very little guides available for me. I need to figure most of the things out myself. No one is gonna hold my hand. Step one is to put the plants in. There you go. Yep. 
This should be a good enclosure, I hope, I think, I suspect. Uh, yeah. Let me add some paper towel on the bottom, just small so they can hide in it and to retain moisture. Step two is introducing the caterpillars in here. Filming this is not so easy, and if it looks awkward, you'll have to forgive me. It's quite hard. So I use, I let them walk here on these tweezers. I don't squeeze them. And oh my God, they're running everywhere, and they're very hard to see because they're so small. Paste them here on the plant, because that's where they would like to roam. Here you go. Come on, guys. Yes, that's right. That's right, that's where we want you to be. Yes. Come on. Even if a dozen of these caterpillars turn into a moth, I will consider it a success. A survival rate of even 10% is what I consider to be good when it comes to the black witch. It may sound cruel, but breeding methods become refined over time. It comes with experience. But I cannot rely on that right now. I'm going in blind. The babies of witch moths and their relatives can easily be confused with geometrids in the early life stages. It's just the way they walk and run. Very cute, but be careful, they can escape easily. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you're witnessing the start of something great. And for now, we shall leave them alone. And... Tomorrow I shall check up on them and hopefully by then they've started eating. That would be great. I hope I found the right plants. Day number one in the rainforest. We don't know what to expect, but there is one update. I moved the babies to a slightly bigger container. Don't worry, I'll tell you all about it later. For one day I left the babies alone, so they could eat in peace. And then I check back a little bit later. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah, don't mind my haircut. It was too warm, I cut my hair. But today I'm going to show you something that has never been filmed on YouTube. And I don't think it has been documented anywhere else for that matter. We go to the caterpillars to feed. Now, I ch since yesterday, I slightly changed the setup because I noticed the larva didn't begin to feed, unfortunately. So what I did, I got even a bigger container and I added, I added all the plants in the area that could be the local host plant. And I see there's only one plant they accepted so far. That is Inga. So the funny thing is, if you check literature, the black witch has many host plants, such as prosopsis, uh, even ficus or fig tree, uh, robinia, uh, inga, mimosa, acacia. Um, there's actually many more. Come to think of it, let me think what, oh yeah. I think it's like called cryptocaria, another Fabacia plant. But in each local area, such as Brazil, Argentina, or the United States, or the Caribbean, as you can imagine, all have different plants. And it's quite possible that in all these localities they prefer to feed on different plants. So some of their typical host plants were rejected, but Inga was a great success. Let me show you what's happened. It may not look like much, but this is a very special moment. If I manage to complete this life cycle, I think I am one of the first. Now, I know one friend in the USA who has raised them in captivity, so I guess I am not the world's first person. But still, there is very little documentation and very few people have managed to pull this off because this is a difficult species. So this is a really good challenge for my ability as a breeder. It may not look like much, but this is a very special moment. If I manage to complete this life cycle, I think I am one of the first. Now, I know one friend in the USA who has raised them in captivity, so I guess I am not the world's first person. But still, there is very little documentation and very few people have managed to pull this off because this is a difficult species. So this is a really good challenge for my ability as a breeder. 
This is the leaf of the Inga. Notice how they prefer young leaf and as you can see last night they've chewed a lot of holes in it and let's hope the camera is willing to do and the stupid camera isn't focusing. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Inga that I included and as you can see last night many holes were chewed in it. There you go. And as you can see the larvae are resting on it. They've grown a little bit even, even in one day. Can you see that? Now most of the caterpillars prefer to rest on the underside of the leaves. Have to be real careful because this species does not like to be stressed. Aha! Can you see this? So here's a lot of caterpillars, can you see that? Here there's like five or six caterpillars resting on the nerve of the plant. And in this case, as you can see, they clearly chose the inga, especially the young tender leaves, which are the easiest to chew for the small caterpillars. So this is the start of a very special journey. Caterpillars are now very small, but they're going to be very big. And more importantly, I'm one of the first people to do this. So that's going to be fantastic. If, really hoping this breeding project will work out. You are watching History Unfold on YouTube. The biggest black witch moth breeding experiment that I'm aware of and hopefully the most well documented and successful one. But I don't know, we need to have results first. I discovered something. The caterpillars exclusively feed on young shoots and leaf buds. They refuse to touch mature leaves. Now this applies to Inga, the plant they are currently eating. I'm not sure if this applies to other plants too. Maybe they can eat mature leaves of other plants. However, if you want to breed the black witch moth like I did, make sure you use young plants with soft and young leaves and young shoots. The caterpillars mostly feed at night in the darkness, so make sure to place them in a room with no artificial light at night. This is the start of a big project. Perhaps the biggest project that I've done so far. My dream is to travel the world and to raise insects all over the globe. But this lifestyle is expensive and unsustainable, so I need sponsors like Regua. And I'm very grateful this natural reserve wanted to sponsor my scientific work. I'm so happy. So we check back just a few days later, about three and a half days later. Let's see how they're doing. Is Bart Coppens going to be one of the first people to document how to breed the black witch on the internet? Probably. Depends on how they're doing. Oops, I have the hiccups. Um, it's time to take a look inside. Alright folks, it looks like the larvae have grown a lot and have eaten a lot. Here's one of them. As you can see they've grown significantly bigger. They're very good at hiding. But not good enough because I can see them. However folks, I feel like a plastic box is not good enough for them. So I want to raise the uh, first and second instar in a cage. I only place them in a, in a plastic box because it's a good contained environment for hatchlings but now we're going beyond. So here I have something um, that I prepared in advance because uh, I have been prepared for this project. I haven't received funding for it so it has research value and I'm getting paid for it. 
So um, I prepared many house plants, and these are young Inga saplings, they're house plant. And I figured this would be very useful for rearing them. So I'm going to place these Inga saplings here in this box. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, oops, you have to be careful. I'm going to place these saplings in this cage here. That's right. And now I'm going to release the caterpillars in here so that they can roam freely and eat their natural food. And the plant will stay alive for a long time if I water it. So I plan to take most of the host plant out. And whoop, place it in here. See if the larva will transfer to the new food in a while. And I hope that they will. There we go. So there's many caterpillars in here, but most of them are hidden because they hide very well in the vegetation, but you'll see. All right, guys, uh, I know you're eager to see some caterpillars. Those were awkward images, but I divided them not in one, but two different cages. So here is black witch cage number one, black witch cage number two. Both cages contain hundreds of caterpillars. And um, I noticed they started prolifically eating already, so I think we're ready to take a look at finally at the caterpillars, because that's what you're eager to see, right? So as we can see, immediately they started feeding. Let's so zoom in on the leaves. This is a bit hard to see. But especially down here. You see it, there's a lot of caterpillars here in the back that are feeding. See if there's better ways to show it. Lights off. For a moment we wait until midnight. Just for a few hours. So here through the plastic we can observe something very interesting. And that's the fact that they <clears throat> only want to eat the youngest leaf. Can you see that? So here we see that most of the leaf is uneaten, but if we zoom in, here we see a bunch of young leaves, and the young leaves, these caterpillars have devoured them almost right away. Can you see it? And just to zoom out here, this is filmed from outside of the cage. But can you see that? They are eating the young leaves. Can you? Wow. So we can see they've grown already in a very short amount of time. The larvae are, dare I say, almost doubled in size. Let's see if I can get the light any closer without scaring them. Oh yeah, oops, let's not make reflection. Can you see that? Oh, hmm, the reflection is bad. But there you go. So this is official, these are black witch. I think most of them are first instars, but I think I already see one second instar individual. And this is massively interesting. This is definitely a first. And here on the older leaf we see some individuals, but not as much. Seem to be resting here. Pressed against the leaf. I think actually that these are about to shed their skin to the second instar. As you can see their head capsule is uh, small and bloated. Oh, they're fighting. They don't like each other's presence. So if these are definitely shedding to the second instar. So tomorrow we should have uh, already instar number twos. So that's fascinating and fantastic if you ask me. This is, uh, this is a fantastic and great success. Here we can see actual... Well, well, well. These babies should be instar number one and two. Right now they are in a cage. If you want to raise the black witch, it's important to keep them humid. They're a rainforest species in this case. They also like to hide during the day and will come out to feed at night in the darkness. In nature the caterpillars are completely solitary. 
The only reason why there are a lot of them right here is because I'm raising a big group in a cage. I would like to see if other breeders can breed these insects too in the future after I publish the first care sheets and the first tutorial on the internet that shows people how to breed them. Interestingly, some of the adults are getting old, but they are still alive, as you can see. So here in this cage, I have uh, two females. And the females, they are a bit damaged, because they are several weeks old, actually. They've laid hundreds of eggs, but they are still laying eggs. So, they can live for a long time and produce a lot of ova. Once again, we wait. Rearing moths takes a lot of patience, time and care. We must complete the grand transformation. Everybody is counting on me. People bought flight tickets. People let me stay in Brazil for free, for three months, just for me to raise these insects. So I feel a lot of pressure to succeed. Perhaps this is a good time to remind everyone that we are looking for volunteers to help us raise moths in captivity and help us out with other work at Regua. Do you see our email addresses? Please send us an email. It's a great place to boost your entomology career. Anyway friends, it's time to check back later and see how our babies are doing. Well guys, it's been a few days since we checked the larva. It's currently in the middle of the night, so I'm using some equipment to get better lighting. Now, I'm so proud of raising the Black Witch. Like, have you ever seen anyone do this? I'm really proud. This was always a life goal of mine. And the thing is, I'm still a young guy. I'm going to spend all my life raising moths. And I'm almost 30 years old, but 30 is a good age. I'm gonna be breeding moths when I'm 40, I'm gonna be breeding moths when I'm 50, I'm gonna be breeding moths when I'm 60 or 70 or 80 years old, I don't care. I'm committing my life to this, and together I'm going to show you the coolest pieces on YouTube. So let me show you guys. Ah. So, one thing that we have is we really have uh, mixed ages here. Moths of uh, mixed ages, because the, the, the parents of the black witch, they just kept laying eggs over and over and over for many weeks. So the youngest babies are two weeks younger than the oldest ones. And the two weeks difference in age is something that you can really see in insects. So, oh yeah, let's zoom in here. Oh, here we have one of them. Let's see if there's more. Oh my gosh, we are really succeeding with this project. This is Insta number three, and as far as I'm aware, it's the first footage of them. I have to be honest, they really remind me of the European underwing moth caterpillars, or catocala. It makes sense though, considering those are related. They're also beautifully marked right now, and very shy. I'm going to be honest with you, however, I don't really know the number of babies we have. They are just too well hidden in the vegetation for me to be able to count them. I do think there are significantly less of them than the ones we started out with. Some of the big caterpillars seem to outcompete the babies for the best leaves. Oh, this one seems to be eating the young leaves of Inga. No, this footage is not sped up. This is real time. This is how fast they really eat. I'm glad they are still alive. Honestly, I feel a lot of pressure to succeed. People invested so much in this project, and I want to prove to them that I have what it takes to bring the results. All my years of breeding and making videos about moths, all the experience that I have, right now it is time to put it to the test.
Is that not fascinating? Ooh. Oh yeah, Team Bart Coppens always wins, baby. Ooh. That's right. Now let's leave them alone. Maybe some water. Yeah, spray them. They like to be humid. Spray them with water, yeah. There you go. And now leave them alone. These caterpillars are very nocturnal, so they don't want to be left alone in an artificial light. They need some good, strong darkness to feed at night. But say no more. It's something that I arranged for them. If you turn off the lights now, and we check them tomorrow. Time passes slowly in Brazil. Maybe it's the atmosphere. Maybe it's the climate. But as time passed on, I was taking care of the caterpillars in the laboratory. It took them about 8 to 10 days for them to transform to the next life stage. Let's show you the laboratory and see how they are doing right now. Now guys, the black witches have grown in size, although their size is quite pretty variable. Some larvae have stayed pretty small, while others have grown huge, I don't get it. It's also really hard to find them now because their camouflage has become really perfect. And I noticed there are less larvae now. I think I had some mysterious losses and I'm not sure why. Some of them just seem to have disappeared. And we have a smaller amount of larvae now. It's hard to count them because they are super well hidden. Let's take a look. It may not seem like much, but these are the first living images of the fourth instar of the black witch moth caterpillar. I'm also pretty sure I'm one of the first, if not the first, to make video footage of the caterpillars of this species in general, on top of being the first to document the entire life history, record all the life stages, make a breeding guide and a video. So feast your eyeballs on these exclusive images, you are watching it happen live. The larvae are beautifully marked and they like to hide by tightly pressing themselves against branches. In captivity it's easy to see them, but in the wild this technique would really work, especially if they're hidden in a huge tree. Well, 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 well. It looks as if uh, some percentage of the larvae have grown significantly bigger. This is one of the more larger individuals. I'm not sure how big it is, I would say it's around 3 or 4 centimeter right now. That's quite a bigger size. And now we'll get some very exclusive footage of the larva. There we go. As you can see we have, uh, as we can see it has red forelegs. If we gently look all the way down. It has a very nice camouflage pattern and it's kind of flat. They like to press themselves against the trunk of the food plant. During the day they also like to hide in leaf litter. There we go. Come on little larva, you're gonna be YouTube famous. Come on little one. Come on. Ah. Now if this was a katokala it would be fully grown but it's not. I think it has at least one more instar to go. If not more. And the silly thing just fell down. Don't worry, I've got it. Yeah, you're a silly one, ain't you? You're a silly one. Now I must admit, a lot of the larvae seem to have disappeared and I'm not sure why. Did I have losses for some reason? Or did the larvae cannibalize each other? I'm not so sure. Or they are just very well hidden. As you can see, they're very good at hiding themselves. I also have many younger larvae still, for some reason. Not all of them are growing equally large. Now, there is an age difference in the larvae. Some are younger than others, because the females just kept laying eggs. But I feel like this size difference is not completely normal. They should be all more similar in size, to be honest. If you're wondering why the caterpillars of witch moths can be hard to find, this is why. So here we have Ascafala odorata, the black witch moth. And funny thing is, despite the fact that the larva is very big, 
it's like perfectly hidden in this branch. Sorry for filming that, that is actually my light ring that I use to illuminate it for good lighting. I can afford stuff like that thanks to the people who donated to my channel. Anyway, lighting is important, but here, this is the problem. This is why you very rarely see caterpillars of black witches or any of their relatives, even if they are common moths in some parts of South America. The larvae live very hidden lifestyles. During the day they hide under rocks and other objects and also just against the branch of trees and they are sitting there very tightly and it's very hard to distinguish them from the plant. Just look at those crazy cool spiracles it has though. It's kind of colorful isn't it? Well here's some rare exclusive footage of uh, Ascalefa odorata, the caterpillar. Mm. It's awesome, isn't it? I hope you enjoyed this short clip. The days in Regua are passing by. Regua is a natural reserve in southeast Brazil. And Regua's prime objective is to protect the forest and its biodiversity from further destruction. And to restore some of the lost forest and species through planting and reintroduction programs. Over the last two decades, Regua has created a protected area of over 11,000 hectares and has planted thousands of trees, restored lost wetlands and has successfully reintroduced tapirs back to the area that were extinct here. I helped with some other duties too, such as checking out the tapirs that we are taking care of. There we go. Stop everyone. We're gonna look for tapirs. Hope I don't get my camera on something. There you go. Thanks. Hello everyone, this is Hi, Michaela. Too. What's up? Now From you've Rago seen her Brazil. too. Sorry, I... I... Hmm. No, because she knows that he's going to feed the other one. There's a male. Well, tapirs are fantastic, but they are not what this video is about. This video is about a black witch moth research project. So it's time to head back to the laboratory and see how they are doing. All right, people, the scale of the breeding project has grown. I have various cages here with moth species that I'm researching. It also includes other species, but most of this is the black witch. Um, the black witch is the main species that I'm researching right now. And one of the questions is how do the larvae develop? What do all the larval stages look like? What kind of plants they prefer? And I'm doing a lot of experiments here in the laboratory. And I think it's going quite well, so let me show you some of the results. Alright guys, this is some of the first video footage on the entire internet of the caterpillars of the black witch moth. Yes, that's right. Some of the first footage of all of social media and all of the internet. Now their life cycle is known to science and their host plants. But I don't think a comprehensive rearing has ever been documented. So that makes this video and this experiment really a first of its kind. And now we can take a finally a good look at the larva of the black witch. Just look at how awesome it looks though. It has really awesome spiracles on the side of its body. It's very flat. It likes to live a hidden lifestyle. It prefers to eat young leaves too. 
This is an almost fully grown caterpillar. It is instar number five. Now captive raised individuals are probably a little bit smaller than wild ones. But it's still one of the larger rabbit moth caterpillars that I have ever seen. And it probably needs to grow a little bit more even in order to make a cocoon. Then again, the fact the moths are large doesn't mean the caterpillar should be huge. They have less body fat than emperor moths for example. So they can have a large wingspan but a lower biomass. The caterpillars definitely hate being handled, so this is just for educational purposes. And since I am one of the first people even managing to breed this insect, I hope people aren't correcting me in the comments already and telling me how I should handle them. Amazing. Hopefully this video will also inspire more people to try and raise and study them. What is interesting, however, is not that not all my caterpillars are the same life stage. This is due to differences in age. Some eggs were laid later, so some are younger than others. And in captivity, big caterpillars also outcompete small ones for the best and youngest leaves. And this creates a bottleneck effect. Alright guys, so if we look here in the vegetation, I have a very important update. I noticed something down here and I couldn't believe my eyes. Let's show you guys what it is that I found. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the first black witch pupa that I managed to produce somehow. Oh my gosh. Take a look people, here it is, it's official. The first pupa! And to me this is the proof that I can breed anything if I put my mind to it. Um, okay, maybe that's an overstatement, but really I never imagined that the black witch is something that I would ever raise in my lifetime and that I would figure out how to raise them by myself. And I did! I freaking did it! Isn't that great guys? So this makes me feel very motivated for more species in the future. Don't ever feel discouraged because you think a species is too hard for you. With enough time, preparation and materials, you can do it. So there you go, isn't this fantastic? A real pupa of the black witch. The first one and the rest of the caterpillars is going to pupate soon. So wow, that is just fantastic. I'll drink a monster energy to that guys to celebrate because this is an achievement. I hope I don't sound like I'm bragging, but I can't believe I've done it. That's fantastic. We did it and we did it on YouTube. That's absolutely insane. That's absolutely crazy in my opinion. Wow. It's truly a fantastic achievement. Even if I say so myself. Breeding the black witch moth. That's fantastic. Cheers! So what's really interesting about the rest of these larvae is how they manage to avoid light in several ways. <clears throat> During the day, they are really good at hiding. There you go. So here's one of the more fully grown caterpillars and during the day they just sleep in the flower pots. Well, it's not a flower pot, but I don't know how else to call it. Um, so they just hide in here in these crevices. Sometimes they almost kind of burrow, as you can see. But these are close to pupating. Let's get a nice shot of you. Ah, the pupae of the black witch moth. I store them in a container of vermiculite. I spray the vermiculite in order to keep it humid. 
as time is passing by, the babies are growing well in the laboratory. Since they are starting to pupate, I'm keeping a close eye on them while taking care of my other duties. Guys, I took some of the fully grown caterpillars with me in a plastic box, just to give you guys a little close up. Now we have to do this quickly because the larvae of this species hate being touched and handled. It gives them a lot of stress. It's bad for them, so we're gonna make this quick. But this is really a first on YouTube and a, one of the first on the internet. So this needs to be documented properly. And I think this justifies taking a closer look at some of the fully grown larvae. Those of you who are wondering why I don't show many larvae at once, it's because they are very sensitive to stress. They don't like being touched, they don't like being grabbed, they don't like being handled. So in this video I am being very careful. I'm not do holding fistfuls of caterpillar like I do in most of my videos. So here I have a select few of larvae that are fully grown. In fact one of them, this one right here, is in the process of pupating as you can see. This one is, yep. So this is one is going to be a pupa in a few days. So these are really completely fully grown caterpillars. What's funny is uh, actually um, in captivity, I suspect they are a bit smaller than in the wild, but still the larvae of this species, even in the wild, aren't that big compared to their wingspan. That's because the moths actually have a smallish body compared to uh, very long and thin wings. So in terms of biomass, really, the wings don't really take up that much space. But this is a breakthrough because for a long time people considered the black witch to be completely unbreedable in captivity. And this video here, it practically proves people wrong. We can breed it. Now this kind of touching and handling is actually bad for the larvae. I don't recommend doing it. I'm just doing it right now for educational purposes. To show off what the caterpillars really look like when they're fully grown as you can see. Uh, they're starting to run away. This species panics very, very easily. They're so sensitive to stress. So I really don't recommend touching them like this. I'm only doing it like once, just to show you guys how well they're doing. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, take a good look. These are just some of my larvae. I have many more, but I really didn't even want to stress all of them at the same time. In total, I have about, I think I have about 30 or more. So there you go. I really did not want to stress them too badly. But this gives you a very unique opportunity to, sh to see the life cycle of a species that's never shown before on YouTube and never anywhere else on the internet really. And of that I am really really proud. Like this is a, a crowning achievement. Like this is something that very few people will ever be able to do in their lifetime. So if you guys are wondering, what do the fully grown caterpillars look like of the black witch moth? Here's your answer. So this one is, a, we have to be really careful. This one is like really literally pupating right now. I am making them uncomfortable a little. But I think it's okay sometimes if it's educational and like this is something, I don't think I'm ever going to raise this species again, right? So this is your only chance to feast your eyes on uh, the black witch. Wow. And the larvae, they are really shy. They like to hide away from daylight. They like to hide under objects. They even can burrow sometimes. To prove my point, let me add a little leaf here in the container and I bet most of the caterpillars, they will decide to hide under the leaf if we wait a bit. So this larva here, yeah. Let's see if it will hide. There you go. I don't think it's gonna come out here. Eh? No. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. One of the worst first and only breedings of the Black Witch. 
Well, I don't think I'm the first. I know there's other people in history who've raced them before. So it's just very rarely done. Uh, now, it's funny how the larvae are able to run so fast. Like I'm used to rearing silk moths, the Saturnids, and their larvae are really slow. And it's funny how fast these guys can run. It's crazy, isn't it? And fully grown the larvae are about, I think they're, they're about between eight, eight to 10 centimeters in size. Some of these are not nearly fully grown. They still have to grow a little bit. But these lovely little worms here, they're somewhat large. They're like a, they're like a big Katokala larva, to be honest. So there you go. Yo. That's really awesome, guys. I think it's time to put them back. I think I stressed them enough. Just to give you guys a little impression, but um, let's put the animals' safety first and their comfort before views on YouTube. I think you guys have a nice close-up and I think I made my point, so it's time to put them back. But let's put some of you guys back. I only have a few fully grown larvae per cage because they eat a lot and they don't like being overcrowded. So I put like three larvae per cage. This will be okay. Guys, I was just looking here in the leaf litter and I found something, as you can see. Oops, my hand is shaking. If we turn this around, we see a, well, a flimsy cocoon with a larva in it. Can you see it? So the, if you're wondering if this species makes a cocoon, the answer is yes. As you can see, they do make a silk cocoon. But it's a very weak cocoon. It's almost like the Katokala we raised before the underwing moths. They spin a few leaves together with silk and they pupate in it. However, I have a better place for it to pupate, so I'm gonna take this one. So this one is going to transform into a moth. And that's great, that's fantastic. Let's give it a better enclosure to pupate. Wow, the cocoon of the black witch moth. Hold up. Video. Do you see this? Yeah, we have even more pupae. Oh yeah, babes. Soon we are going to have many moths. All the larvae are starting to pupate. And here are more caterpillars that are pupating. Yep. Now we just have to wait for the moths to come out. <clears throat> At this point, a lot of time went by. But that is okay, we are patient after all. The pupae of this species take about 5 to 6 weeks to hatch. Here is a tip. Make sure to add leaves and sticks on top of the vermiculite. Because the vermiculite is too slippery to the emerging moths. And it seems they struggle to pull themselves out of it. Make sure they have objects to hang on to. A few weeks passed and then finally it was time to go back in the laboratory for a breakthrough. In the middle of the night. Are you ready? Ladies and gentlemen, in collaboration with Regua Reserva Ecológica de Guapiazu, I have completed one of the only rearings in captivity of the black witch moth because today I saw the first witch moth has come out 
Now we have to be careful, these animals are stressed very easily and will fly away in seconds. So we are very careful with this. If he's upset, he will fly away. You should. My god. Its wings are still wet. See them, if I blow against them with my breath. You can see that the wings are kind of sloppy, it's like a wet drapings, they're still drying. I'm guessing this meal has just come out of the pupa. And if we zoom in a little, we see the excellent beauty of this species. Now, judging from this meal, he's clearly just come out. If we look down here, we can see the empty pupal shell. See that? This is his empty pupa he just came out of. Guys, quite selfishly, I wonder if this male will allow me to hold it. This species does not like being touched at all. They are very easily scared, as you can see. Oh, never mind. He's sitting here. I don't, I don't think I need to hold him on my hand if we can get a close-up like this. Wow! This species really is truly big and stunning. And I'm sure I've told you guys before, but in many cultures this species is asso associated with bad luck and diseases. That's why it's called a witch moth, uh, also known as Mariposa Bruja. I think in Portuguese, Bruja means witch. I think it's also called the Bruja Negra, which means obviously a black witch. Now, I really would like it to be on my hand. It's probably me demanding too much. Oh yes, please stay there. <gasps> oh my God. Quite literally, this is one of the happiest moments in my life. Some people may find that to be a very strange statement because why would holding a moth be a happy moment in your life? It's hard to explain, but it's about achievement, it's about hard work. Here am I raising a species that was very definitely challenging to raise. I had to use my brains, I had to use my experience, my expertise, and it all paid off. And this is my reward. A dazzling, dazzlingly beautiful creature. Just look at how amazing its colors are if we zoom in, though. It's just amazing. So you can see its markings are almost metallic purple under a certain angle. It has a beautiful face with two huge black eyes. It's a very, very skittish piece. It's very ready to fly away. They can get scared very easily. It looks like this male is a little bit small though. But that's because captive raised moths tend to be smaller than their wild counterparts. Even if you are a good breeder, there's not much you can do about it. But this is a captive raised black witch moth. And that, my friends, is something special to celebrate. Yay! Are you happy? I'm really doing my best. Hope my YouTube fans are satisfied with this one. Wow. And this is obviously a male, because the males are grayish black. The females are much lighter. They're even more light gray, with even a white marking on the wing. It's the males that are completely gray blackish. And the markings on their wings are fabulous. Another thing that it makes this video special is this is the first life cycle of a butterfly or moth in the moth cycle series that I have recorded in a foreign country. My home country is the Netherlands, a country in Northern Europe. 
and I came all the way to Brazil to study the life cycles of butterflies and moths in the Brazilian Atlantic rainforest. And right now I'm staying in Brazil for half a year and I'm going to return here also. Every winter, usually around February, I take a flight to Regua, Brazil. February because that's the best month for insects here. So if you ever want to visit us, make sure to come in February. But it also marks the first life cycle of any insect that I have reared. Well, not in the Netherlands, I guess, from this web series. And this week marks the beginning of a new era on my channel. Because one of my big dreams is to travel the world to raise moths in every country. Imagine if I could stay in Australia in the rainforest, or in Papua in the rainforest, or in Costa Rica, or in Malaysia. I would love to have a space such as a laboratory and moth trapping equipment in any natural reserve around the world, only to live there for a couple of months just to raise the native insects and document the life cycles. Sorry for that sound. This would effectively turn me into a traveling entomologist slash influencer who can travel the world and con contribute to science by documenting life cycles of insects and documenting their life cycles on YouTube. Now guys, tell me in the comments, what do you think about this species? Are you happy to see it? This is one that I've always wanted to raise and it's crazy to hold such a fresh fresh specimen. Its wings are completely perfect as you can see there is no damage and it's if we zoom in like it's crazy how beautiful shiny and pearlescent is. I'm going to take a lot of time filming it because I'm proud you know. I feel like a proud father like a proud parent. But this is just insanely gorgeous. It does seem to have some little damage here on the forewing already, from flying a little maybe. Hmm, the skills they scrape off pretty fast in captivity. So, but this is great, man. This is wonderful. I'm giving you all some time to stare at it because I don't think I'm ever going to film the life cycle of this insect again. This is the one and only time in my life that I'm going to film this life cycle, so I, I better take all the time that I can, all the time that I need, just to get this beautiful close-up shot of an insanely gorgeous black witch moth. Look at this silly little face, like it's ridiculous. The species has such large eyes. And you can see the palps, which are the mouth parts that it also can use to taste and smell. For some reason it looks like it's missing one of the palps, isn't it? I only see one. As you can see, no animal is perfect. That's the cool thing about insects. If you rear them, you see all sorts of imperfections, but also strange variations. Sometimes you get cool color variations and stuff. Wow, isn't it so amazing? I am baffled. And it's really those crazy eye markings. Are these eye spots? I don't know, they're, they're kind of, they're like, they're almost eye spots, but not entirely. I wonder what the function of these markings is. It probably functions similar to eye spots, or maybe it's like a distracting marking to predators who will prefer to attack it instead of the insect's head or other parts of his body, I don't know. Also important to know is the black witch moth is an obligate frugivore. So the black witch moth, uh, they come to fruit and they don't visit flowers as far as I know. There are, as far as I know, no reports of black witch moths coming to feed on fruit. Ah, uh, sorry, there are, as far as I know, no reports of black witch moths coming to feed on flowers or nectar. They don't feed on flowers, they only feed on fruit, as far as I know. So, but that's normal. Actually, many of the relatives, think, think about Catocala, the underwing moths. They are also found in the United States. And 
Not in South America, though, but they are the closest relative in America that I could think of, but also think of other fruit-piercing moths. They are actually also in the same family, the, uh, the Arabidae, but also the same subfamily, the Arabinae. Now, that sounds like crazy Harry Potter spells, but I'm talking some real moth systematics here and talking about their biology to make a comparison. But what I'm really trying to say is many of the Arabid moths are fruit feeders by nature. And the black witch, I guess, is no exception to that. Just like most of his relatives. Although there's, there are exceptions, of course. It's a huge generalization. Some under wings do come to flowers. But black witch moths don't. As far as I know, they never come to flowers. Wow. That's super. Guys, this is incredible. Now, do these moths really bring bad luck, guys? Are indigenous cultures right about them? Are they really black witches associated with black magic? Whoops, we're about to find out. Because uh, if anybody is cursed, it would be me right now for raising these creatures in captivity. I mean, I'm, I'm out here raising witches. So, that means I should be cursed, right? It means I should have like 10 years of bad luck now for touching and raising these animals. Well, I think such myths and myth mythology is interesting. It makes these moths a bit mysterious and cool. You know, they're like real um, sorcerers of the moth world, you know. But at the same time, I also don't like it because it makes these it makes these harmless creatures look scary and and harmful. Okay, I'm pretty sure a moth is not going to curse your family or your children. <laughs> They're pretty harmless animals. And while I like mythology and I like learning about the cultures of South America and I respect the cultures, at the same time, I wish they wouldn't vilify animals. Because insects, they need more love and appreciation, and not vilification. Alright folks, so what's going to happen with our cheeky little specimen here? Well, I feel like keeping this meal at least till it's morning. And tomorrow I will release it in the moth breeding space that I have built for this species, believe it or not. So we're gonna put it back, there you go. Well, it doesn't wanna go back into its cage, that's a bit silly. Come on, man, your rings are still soft, you don't wanna be flying, it could break your rings. You're vulnerable right now, come on, go back. Yes. All right, folks, let's zip, zip this one up. I'll check back tomorrow and then release it into the breeding aviary. Now guys, in collaboration with Regua, I'm developing a moth research house. And this research house is going to be used to document the life cycle of several moths and butterflies in my lifetime. Let me show you the inside. So this is a new science project that I'm developing. It's not that sophisticated, it's just almost like a small wooden greenhouse. And inside I can keep the moths alive. Let me close the door. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for watching this old wrinkly moth man on YouTube. That's really just showing off his passion. Well, so this is the new enclosure, right? It's big enough for a moth. I mean, it's bigger than my freaking room. So let's release our moth and see how, how he does. So in the future, I'm going to release all my moths in here, in this space. Come on, fly buddy. Woo, did you see that? Ah, yeah, there he goes. Ah, flying around, can you see it? Is he happy? I hope he is happy. Look at that. So in this space, I want to breed those insects. It's going to be used for other insects too in the future. 
I do have an issue with the door. For some reason the door has a gap here in it. It's badly constructed and smaller pieces can escape through the door. I need to fix it. It's a technical issue. But it's uh, working fine so far. So... Here you go, buddy. Uh, you're gonna be free. Now these, these black witch moths, they feel very comfortable if they're sitting on whoop, any black object. So it's all like the black walls. I bet it feels very camouflaged on there. Haha. Yes, you, you're YouTube famous, you beauty. Show people how you can fly. So that's cool. Very beautiful. For our little moth here, I've also got some bananas, right? They're frugi force. So here I have a, a very basic feeder. It has rotting banana. And this is what they like to eat. So I'm hoping at night this moth is going to feed itself by drinking from the banana. Although the banana looks a bit too rotten, maybe I should replace it with new banana. Also trying to grow flowers here, right? This is a developing butterfly house. It isn't finished yet. Still needs some work, some constru construction. It's a bit rough around the edges. But the black witch is the first species that I'm inviting in my new butterfly house. And I, it would be cool if we can get them to mate here, you know, and make more babies and complete the whole life cycle. Buddy, I remember when you were a tiny little egg two months ago. I raised you, did you know that? And you're gorgeous, I'm the proudest parent ever. Gorgeous markings. What a gorgeous insect, yo. I'm hoping it's going to feel comfortable in here. I did my best to build a great enclosure for it. This piece is really does not like to be touched, as you can see. So, I'm gonna abandon it and leave it alone for a while. It's cool that we can see how they fly. As you can see, they are very fast and strong flyers. That's a nice little butterfly house, right? It needs some more work because the insects keep escaping. But I think this big, big one cannot escape. Another problem I have is ants and wasps killing my butterflies and moths. But we'll figure it out. This is my first butterfly house. I'm inexperienced. I'm going to use it for butterflies and moths. But we have our first resident in there right now. <sighs> it's all thanks to you guys, by the way. Well, that was it. Over two weeks went by. Our first male was single and alone. But he enjoyed the enclosure that I designed. He was much earlier than the other moths. The good news is that if I can keep this moth alive for a few weeks, that means it's possible to keep them alive in a small butterfly house made with netting. That's what we want. About two weeks later, however, I had a juicy update. Ladies and gentlemen, it appears another moth has come out and I think it's a very, very small female. Smallest female I've probably ever seen, to be honest. Like, shamefully small for this species. There she is, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, this, the female of this species is different than the male because they have a whitish, creamy band running over their wings. Now one thing that's annoying is that she has already chipped her hind wing. She's just come out. And that's because this species is so wild, they are so easily stressed, that even after hatching in captivity they will start flying around like crazy, flapping their wings. And so in no time, they're going to have a little bit of damage, like it's 
very hard to see a perfect specimen in captivity unless you are literally there straight after they hatched. And this is one issue. Like, I bet a lot of the moths that are going to come out of the pupa are going to have some damage on the wings just because they've been alone in this cage for a while, flapping around like crazy. And while they do that, they can chip off small parts of the wings. Now, those of you who say that's cruel, Bart, you shouldn't keep these animals in captivity if they do that. They're hurt, they get a lot of stress. Don't worry. It happens on the wild too, just perhaps not as fast. Um, but also, this is for research purposes. I'm one of the only people who is properly documenting all the life stages of this insect. So what I'm doing here benefits this insect and their conservation. Not a lot of people have figured this out. So it's not just for fun. I'm pretty sure that the means justify the end. When I'm also sure that the end justifies the means. It goes two ways. Anyway, this is a beautiful female, but she's stupidly small. Just compare her size. Just compare her size to the size of my hand, which I will put next to her. So see, see how small she... Now, well, some people will say, Bart, that's still a big moth. Yeah, it's still a big moth. But for a black witch, this is the smallest I've ever seen. In the wild, they are much bigger. And I suppose that's a problem with captive rearing insects. Uh, in a lot of cases, in captivity, they are much smaller than their wild counterparts. But I'm not disappointed. I'm still happy with this result. And more, more moths are coming out as well. Ladies and gentlemen, the last time we had a dwarf female, the tiny, tiny female. This time we have one that actually has a big size. Uh, but she's not very cooperative, I'm afraid. Ooh, she's very large, as you can see. Let's try to make a good picture of it. And unfortunately, it seems as if the moth has already made some minor damage on her wings, so that's a bit unfortunate, very unfortunate in fact. Perhaps it is merely the lighting in the room. I do find that their colors vary a lot though. They really do. They can be gray to brownish. And of course we can tell this is a female because of this white band here. Do you see this white band here on the wing? This creamy white band, the males completely lack it. Let me show you a close-up of the male that we read before. This is very dangerous. I've taken her out of her enclosure. She's out in the open in a messy laboratory. This laboratory needs a serious cleanup. But now you can see compared to my hand how big these creatures really are. And I'm not gonna lie, she is really big. They are really big moths. And don't forget, the ones in captivity are often even smaller than the wild ones. So these moths are very large. In fact, they outsize many of the local species of silk moths. They are really beautiful. And of course, she has these beautiful markings, the same ones that the male had, remember that? As you can see, she's starting to miss some wing pieces. I should put her in the butterfly house outdoors pretty soon. I don't want to push it to the limit. If I keep her in this cage for any longer, she's going to destroy her own wings. And none of us want that. We want the best for these insects and give them the best care, the best attention. The best animal husbandry. Because I'm the best breeder, duh. Take a look at that. So beautiful though. Such amazingly super beautiful creatures, wow. I'm one of the only people ever to breed these animals. I'm pretty sure there's very few people ever who've done it. The underside is just grayish as you can see. With a black stripe. She's being really gentle, really comfortable on my finger. 
which is unusual for a species like this because they are usually very shy. Wow. The black witch is an incredible species in many regards. They are super colorful in a way. I'm gonna release her in the flight cage even though it's in the middle of the night. Guys, she needs to be free. Just remember this place? Yeah, it's the middle of the night, but who cares? I'm taking care of my animals. Let's go inside. So what's really cool to see is that some of my witch moths are actually drinking from the banana at night. Although this species is not, is not a black witch. This is another species. And this is a spoiler alert because this is another species that I am also breeding in here. But if you want this life cycle you have to be patient because this is for another video in the future that I'm preparing. Ooh, but here is the proof that the moths that I place here in my greenhouse are in fact feeding and also mating, probably making babies. So you could call this my little witch moth research house. <coughs> you can see one of my older males. After many weeks they are still alive, although they are looking a little bit old now. And the damage on the wings is visible because they lived for several weeks. Poor thing. They are really spooky, super big creatures of the night, aren't they? Wow. This is a very old male that I've had in here for... I think he's over a month old and he's still surviving. Anyway, today we had a new female and I'm releasing her. This is the female that we just raised. She's in a tip-top shape, apart from some of the skills that she lost here on her thorax. I need to find a solution for that. In the future I need to make a bigger cage that they close in when the pupa hatch, so the moths don't damage themselves when they flutter around. The best solution is to immediately remove them when the moths are coming out, but that's not a solution because I'm not always there to monitor it. But as we can see, she is extremely gorgeous. And look at that shimmer that you can see at night if I'm holding the flashlight. Wow! That purple, beautiful shimmer that's so incredibly gorgeous. Wow, guys! Wow, wow, wow! I have no words. It's so beautiful! This is one of the most beautiful moths ever. Let's see if she wants to eat some banana. Like the other witch moth that is feeding here. Hey, do you want to eat? There's a rotting banana for you. Go ahead and drink if you want to. Guys, that's it. Bart Coppen's first moth breeding house in collaboration with Regua. And already one of the first things I did is to reveal the life cycle of a species of which it was poorly studied. So this is why I need breeding space. This is why I need my own laboratory, my own butterfly house, because I can use them for research and science. I know how to raise many species that other people don't raise. This is why I need help. Let's go back. Ignore this species. It's for a different video. As time went by, the moths had a happy life and they kept getting older and older. But the good news is they can live for a long time in this enclosure that I designed. At this point the male is several weeks old and he is visibly starting to age. The female could have mated with him. If that is true, she will soon lay fertile eggs. I will check for that later. At night they are even eating the banana that I placed in the cage, effectively feeding themselves. They really love rotting banana so much.
Uh-oh, it's another day in the laboratory in Regua, and we just found another empty pupa shell. And from this pupa, we just had a very big male hatch. It's the empty pupa. So where is he? Well, I already put him outdoors in the new moth breeding house that we've been developing in Regua. Let's take a look. He's very fresh and he's not flying a lot because his wings are still drying. Let's get going. Yeah, this is the insect rearing laboratory that I'm using, like the real cool entomologist that I am. Ooh, I'm looking dirty, sweaty and terrible. I should shave. Or not, what do you guys think? Is this hair suitable for me? I'm even growing a bit of a mustache. Hmm, that's unusual. Usually I shave myself more often. Let's go. It's a bit dark here. All right. Wow, folks, there he is. Our beautiful new male. And this one is really big. As you can see, this one has a really big wingspan. So I'm proud of that because the previous moths had a very small wingspan. But this one seems to be good size, very even close to wild size and I'm happy with that. This moth has hatched only a few hours ago, he just came out of the pupa. And therefore he is in a near perfect condition. Like I said before, it's very hard to keep these moths fresh. It's very hard to keep them in good condition because they start flying a lot and in captivity this can create friction and because of that part of their wings go missing sometimes. Look at how it's turning around to orient itself. It's probably a bit confused by all the light but look at that. Another extraordinary beauty. Let's make a close up. That, my friends, is just gorgeous. And do you see the shimmer? It has this almost purple, purple violet shine to it. Do you see it? It's really cool how under a certain angle, these moths are shiny, almost like a butterfly. The purple is really beautiful. My flashlight is bringing it out. And look at how big it is. It is bigger than my hand. Look at its large, large eyes. It's large and wonderful body. And look at that, oh, that shiny metallic. It's so awesome. So this moth is completely fresh and that's why it's shimmering so brightly. In older moths, the shimmer tends to get faded. But in the freshest specimen, it just... Oh my god, look at that. This is amazing, look at that, it's like a pearl. It's like model of pearl. It's amazing, isn't it? Wow. So this is our newest male that we raised in captivity. I just wanted to show it off. I'm so proud, like a proud daddy. Wait, is it missing an antenna or no? It isn't. One antenna is just hidden. Is that not just amazing, guys? I love these moths. And to raise them is a total dream. I know I'm probably showing them off a little bit too much right now. You guys will be like, yeah Bart, I get the point, I've seen your moth, move on. No, I'm not moving on. Guys, I literally traveled the world to raise these insects and study them finally. After all these years. Wow, and they are just fantastic. Perfect. Oh, you are beautiful. You are beautiful, you are amazing. I love you. You're an amazing insect. I worship you. You look it's so beautiful. Nature is so amazing, guys, and she makes me so happy. 
Oh my god, look at it glistering, metallic. It's incredible. Can you see that glistering metallic? As I move it, wow, this piece is so shiny. And that's something you don't see in pictures. You really need a video of it to see the extreme shininess of this insect. It's like it's greasy with oil. You see it like only under a certain angle. You see the blue, the violet. It's beautiful. What a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous insect. I'm so proud. I am so proud, guys. And it's also because of you, my viewers, that all of this is possible. It's only because of you people that I was able to travel the world and study moths and butterflies in the wild. Because of my channel and because of my viewers, because of you. Now the real question is, are these moths going to mate in captivity? I raised males, I raised females, but now the males have to mate with the females. That's the last step. That's the last challenge that we have. And then we'll get another generation of babies. Ha ha ha. I'm turning into Buffalo Bill. Now guys, this is your uh, favorite online entomologist Bart and the video is going very well. The next step is to leave our insect alone. He just came out of the pupa, he's probably tired, scared and he needs to some time and space to dry after coming out of the pupa. So let's see if he wants to sit here on this pole. So yeah, let's leave him alone there so he can rest a little bit and recover from all the stress of being handled. Now I do have to guys have to show you guys something. Which is how my my breeding house is going. So in here we have the black witch moth that we just raised from a pupa. And he's resting here, but I also have some other moths in here that I'm studying. Ah here is a female this is one of the females that we raised, remember her? She was born with this, some skills missing on her thorax, you remember that. As you can see she is doing well. She's still very beautiful also. Also very shiny still. Unfortunately I never got a perfect picture of this female. From the beginning she was just missing some skills, so she was always a bit imperfect. But that's okay, these are animals, they are not factory products, they are not iPhones. Animals have imperfections. And this is my first time raising them, so I still have to learn how to raise them the best way. Very, this is uh, one of the largest females I raised. Remember the one that I had that was very small? 
I'm not sure where the small female is. I'm pretty sure she is inside the greenhouse here somewhere. Let's place this one on the wall. I'm surprised she isn't flying very much. This is a very docile female for some reason. She never minds being handled. I wonder why, because a lot of these moths are skittish and will fly away if you touch them. This female seems to be okay with all of it. She seems to be, oh well, all right, never mind. Let's see what else we got. Well, this one is inappropriate. It's not supposed to be in my video. This is an uh, owl butterfly. And believe me or not, in this butterfly greenhouse, I'm raising a lot of species, including owl butterflies. Guys, I'm sorry for the misty image quality. My camera is having issues with the high humidity. But breeding owl butterflies was actually something I was going to keep a surprise for my YouTube viewers. But I think I just spoiled the surprise. Oops, I'm sorry. This is something I was preparing for next year. But uh, this butterfly house does very well with butterflies. And my plan was to at least for next year to start raising owl butterflies here in this greenhouse, but that will be for a video in the future. So, spoiler alert! Haha! <laughs> it's really misty in here right now, guys. Sorry for the very bad image quality, but here we have some of the older moths that we've been raising. So here's one of our other black witches. Let me see if I can get him on camera. This is one of the first ones that we raised and he's getting kind of old. Whoop! He just flew on top of the camera. So, now, oop, there he goes. Can you see him flying? Hey there, old bug. Are you willing to be on YouTube? Maybe he's ashamed because he feels really old and I just called him old. He's gotten a bit um, damaged because this one I think is like three or four weeks old. I would like it if you actually came into the in camera. Hello? Hello? Stop flying around. So the older males, as you can see, they fly a lot because they have a lot of energy. It's the young males that just ah, hatched from the pupa. Those are easy to handle. The old moths are difficult to handle. Ooh, it's so misty here. There he is, very misty video of an older male. Now, this is what, this is pretty much what they look like after a few weeks. Ignore the weird sound guys, there are frogs in the rainforest. But yeah, this is what black witch moths look like after they become like a month old. They become beaten up pieces of the wings are missing but it's normal it also happens in nature in the wild you can sometimes see moths that have big chunks of their wings missing that's because they are old you know the wings the problem is they don't regenerate so if the moths fly around and they bump into something and a small piece of the wing breaks off and this process keeps repeating itself for many weeks eventually the wings just erode away over time they can't grow new wings, the wings cannot heal themselves. So all small damages are permanent and cumulatively it adds up. So at the end of their life the moths will look like this. It's quite a big difference with the fresh male that I just showed you. But I th still think this one is beautiful. This old male is still beautiful in his own way. It's beautiful, it's nature. He may not have the freshest and most colorful markings, he looks old and grey and faded. But that's fine, you know, every moth I love. And I raised this moth from since he was a baby, with love and passion, for my research project here. And for that I'm very proud and I'm very honored that even if the male is old, that he is part of my studies here in Brazil. If you guys are watching, thank you so much, Regua Reserva Ecologica de Guapiatsu, for facilitating my research. It means the world to me, and I hope I can return to Regua many times in the future to raise many more moths. So, wow, okay, he's, he's still beautiful. I think there is beauty in old age as well, you know? It's a natural kind of beauty that you see at the end of your life. People are too afraid of old 
things and too afraid of mortality. It's beautiful when things grow old too, you know. And moths, they age very fast compared to humans. I'm 30 years old, guys. Well, I'm actually 29 right now, but I'm turning 30 this summer. Now, 30 is by no means old, but I'm getting my first wrinkles on my face. I looked into the mirror this year and I was like, wow, I have wrinkles on my face. I've been doing YouTube for almost eight or nine years. I'm feeling old too. Don't get me wrong, I still have a whole life ahead of me to raise many more insects, but age happens, guys. We're, we're not born in the right age to be immortal, unfortunately. So everybody who is watching my video right now, I'm sorry, but you too are immortal and you too are going to grow old. Technology will make it easier to age and technology may hide some of our wrinkles in the future. But you'll never escape death. Now that sounds like a very weird random thing to say in a video about moths. But this is a video about nature and about insects and about life. And mortality is related to that. Now guys, let me tell you another secret. Inside this breeding house, which is still very misty right now, I have more species of witch moths. Oh, what's this? This one is a surprise for later, guys. Ooh, Let's see if we can at least get a small close-up. Ooh, this one has an orange-red underside. What is it? I bet you're getting excited. Guys, here's a little bit of a hint. So I'm not going to talk about this species because it's very tempting. I would love to explain to you its biology, but I can't because this is a video about the black witch moth. And talking about other witch moths in the area would be a bit too distracting. But I'm using this little breeding space, this little greenhouse for research. And one of the things about my research is to raise local butterflies and moths of which the life cycle is unknown. And I've been quite successful at that. I've had mixed results with several species. And as you can see, I'm doing some research on other species in here. Hmm, that's mysterious, isn't it? Oh, what's this? Oh, I wonder what its life cycle is going to be like. Oh, are they as easy to breed as the black witch? Actually, the black witch was very hard to breed. So this one is maybe going to be even harder. Oh, spoiler, teaser for a future video. What is this mysterious species that Bart Coppens is trying to breed in captivity in Brazil? It's surely a very large species, almost as large as the black witch. Ooh, very mysterious. There it goes. Look at that. Ooh, take it all in, guys. Take it all in. Ooh, very pretty, very pretty. What would the caterpillars look like, huh? Hmm. Who knows? Who knows? I'm not going to talk about it. It's a secret. It's a secret for now. It's all a little secret. Don't worry. And we have some butterflies in here too that I'm trying to breed. Ooh, this one is still flying even if I disturb it at night. But maybe I should stop showing you different species. Even though it's really tempting right now. We are here for only one species. For this one. Over time a lot of moths started coming out, but I have decided to stop filming each individual that comes out of the pupa, because otherwise this long video would be even longer. Another day, another giant black witch. Guys, from the, this is the last black witch I'm going to show that has hatched because if I'm going to show you every individual moth that hatches we're going to be busy for a long time Ooh, it's already flying around a little bit unfortunately to make it hard to get a close-up so let's see if we can try here we go a new one has just come out Look at that beauty. 
It's a richy beauty. Here we go, another big beautiful meal. It's going to be the last specimen that I show probably coming from its pupa because we're doing this over and over. And it's gonna stretch the video to insane length if I have to do this. For every insect that comes out of the pupa, hey a new one, hey a new one, hey a new one, guys look. So instead of that I'll just show the ones in a few weeks who have hatched. Oh. Oopsie, sorry for that. I'll show the ones that I have in the greenhouse soon. So I'm gonna keep placing them in the greenhouse, but what a beautiful species, I keep being amazed. It's like a, a bird or a bat really, they look so similar to it. Super cool. This one seems to be shivering, I think today is a bit cold. Ladies and gentlemen, the black witch moth have been inside this butterfly house for several months. And if you can see, they are flying around me. I don't know if you can see it. They are kind of flying. All right, guys, the black witch moths have lived in my butterfly house for several months. We have several individuals here, but we have a problem. To complete the life cycle, we need eggs. Now, females will mate in captivity if you keep them in a large space like this one together with the males. They will find a mate, they will make babies. But the problem is the eggs at this point um, are too small to find in this enclosure. So we need to catch the female and place her in a smaller enclosure. Just so that we can get some eggs. So let me see, is this the female? This is one of the males, these are males. We have, I have several females in here. We also reared multiple females. So let's see. That's a male, so let's move on. We have a lot of them in here. The thing is they're very good sometimes at camouflaging themselves. So we have to look carefully, what's this? You are a male. Ah, you are a beautiful, gorgeous, large male. Looking for the female, for at least one of the females that we have here. Who are you? You are a male. You are another species of witch moth. Not the one I'm looking for. You are an owl butterfly. Aha, uh -huh. here's the female. I wonder if I can just grab the female like this. The females, they are more docile. Ah, that's great. This female has lived in captivity for several weeks, but in order to get some eggs, I need to place her in a smaller enclosure. Because otherwise I can't really find the eggs now, can I? Oh, it's muddy and I'm having a white t-shirt. That's not so smart. Let's see, let's take our beautiful full girl and place her in this cage. See if there's no other moths in here. Yeah, there you go. So this lady will live in the smaller cage for a while. I will take her to the laboratory and hopefully she's going to produce some eggs for us because the eggs are going to produce another generation of witch moths. Well, that's great. Now here's a small message for butterfly farms around the world. There's many butterfly farms in tropical countries like Costa Rica, Malaysia, you know, or just Colombia. Everywhere around the world we got butterfly farms. And a lot of these farms do butterfly breeding, but they don't really consider moth breeding. It's very uncommon to see that. That's a shame because moths have potential. Moths are fun. And there's a lot of spaces that will thrive in captivity and will attract new visitors to your butterfly farm or introduce a new species in captivity. If you are one of these butterfly farms, consider hiring me. You can hire me. I've worked in Cambodia, I've worked in Laos. Right now I'm working in Brazil. I've worked all around the world breeding butterflies and moths. <clears throat> and the thing is, there's a lot of undetermined potential 
when it comes to breeding moths in captivity. But also certain species of butterflies that no one tried to raise in butterfly houses yet. It also has potential for science. Because the life cycle of many species are unknown to science. I would be very happy if people want to collaborate with me, who have a space where I could live, where I can work, where I can breed insects. In return, I can bring you new scientific results, new life cycles to science, free publicity for your butterfly house, because I have a YouTube channel. And most of all, I really, I really just want to have a place where I can breed my insects. It's my passion, it's my dream, it's my life goal. There are so many moths around the world that I haven't raised, and if I find a way to raise them, I will be completely satisfied. I don't need much more. Whoa. So yeah, we can make many spaces like this around the world. This one is in Brazil, but it can be in many other countries. And if we grow the host plants uh, that the moths need, we can discover new things to science and raise insects nobody else has ever raised. Just send me a message in the email and we can collaborate. It's no problem. Well, I caught myself a female. I think it's the only female that we had right now. I'm not so sure. I think so. Um, the females can lay eggs in the big butterfly house that I built for research. But the thing is, the eggs are too small. And if she's laying the eggs here in the house, then no way. They are almost as big as a grain of sand, only a few millimeters. Unfortunately, I made the case very filthy and muddy. That's uh, annoying. But we'll get over it. I'm working in a rainforest to study insects, so a little bit of dirt is normal. So, um, I'm going to feed her sugar water in captivity. I'm going to absolutely pamper her. And in a few days, eggs should appear. If she's mated with a meal, that is. I think so. All right, people, here's the female, the female black witch moth, the femoid. If you don't know what that means, femoid means female. And it's very important that all the teenage boys watching my channel copy that language for me, yeah? Make sure to call all the girls and women that you meet in your life femoids. So you become toxic like Andrew Tate. Just kidding, just kidding. I'm just joking. Actually, did you know, my channel gets watched by women more than by men, most of the time. I'm not joking. So. so, if you want to raise a female in captivity, a female black witch moth, it's important to adequately feed her. Uh, you can feed her with fruit, juice or sugar water. She's getting excited, as you can see. She's flying around. So, let me show you how to do it. It's really simple, it's really easy. So this is in the Regua laboratory where I study the native species of insect. Now this is sugar, yeah? And the diet of most butterflies and moths consists mostly of sugar. Of course, some species also like additional amino acids and salts and minerals, but we're not getting into that because the black witch moth doesn't care. They just want a staple diet of sugar, that's all. So, as you can see, I placed some sugar in here. It needs to be diluted with water. There you go. Let's make sure it dissolves. This is the cup of sugar water. I'm gonna use a knife to stir a little. Actually, that's impractical. I should have used a spoon or a tweezer. But it works, just to dilute the sugar. Um, I recommend using at least 50-50 sugar and water, if you can, maybe even add more water than sugar because hydration is also very important to them. Oops! I apologize for the beer in the background. This is Brahma. It's actually my favorite Brazilian beer. It's very cheap here, and um, of all the cheap beer, it tastes the best, in my opinion. I'm obviously not a connoisseur, and I don't drink your fancy IPA stuff. For the minors watching, guys, drinking doesn't make you cool. Make sure you are an adult if you drink, otherwise um, don't drink alcohol. I don't want to be a bad role model to the minors watching this. But what can I say? I'm a 29-year-old man alone in the jungle, okay? 
I don't have my family here, I don't have my friends here, I don't have girls here. All my entertainment is the insects and the alcohol. Anyway, this is the female black witch. Let's see if we can make a nice close-up of this. Filming this is going to be a bit tricky, I think, but feeding them is very easy. Now the thing is, they're not going to find the food in captivity by themselves. And you can use a sharp object to unroll the proboscis. Now and people are going to say, Bart, you're using a knife, isn't that cruel? Aren't you going to stab it? The answer is no. As you can see, it works perfectly. And I'm unrolling the tongue. And if she's hungry, she's going to drink. I actually don't recommend using a knife for this. Uh, the knife is not hurting her. First of all, insects have a tough exoskeleton and a knife is not going to pierce it. Second of all, this knife is not very sharp. That being said, it's better to use a different tool than a knife, okay? So if you have a tweezer or even a stick at home, I recommend using that instead. A female does not need to be fed every day just every two or three days but make sure that if you feed her she's going to drink a lot so here you can see the tongue it's unfurling can you see it i use the this knife sandwich knife to roll it out and next i place it in the sugar water i have to roll it so she can taste it there you go hope she can taste if she's hungry she will approve and there you go her tongue is rolled out and it's touching the sugar water. Can you see that? That's what you want. If she likes it, she will not roll up the tongue and she's going to be, yes, she's drinking. As you can see right now, the female is completely docile. She's not making any more efforts to fly away. That's because she likes what she's experiencing right now, which is food. So let's roll out your tongue. Can you see that? And effectively, She's drinking at the moment. She's drinking the sugar water. You can see that. How do I know? It's because if she doesn't like it, if she is not hungry, she will immediately roll up the tongue and fly away. So if she's, if she's becoming this docile and just accepting her fate, that means she's drinking and she was hungry. If you look really closely, you can even see that the tip of the tongue is moving. As you can see, it's kind of shaking. Can you see that? Oh, she just rolled it up. Well, that was drinking action. Let's see if she wants to do that again. Come on, you need to drink a little bit more, girl. Guys, as you can see, she drank a little bit of the sugar water. See, but if we roll out her tongue now, the first thing she does is she rolls it up. Can you see it? She's rolling it right back up. What does that mean? If she does that, it means she's not hungry anymore. See? And this is how they show you when they're full. So she did have a little bit of a drink of sugar water, but she wasn't very hungry. But she did have a little bit of food, but that's enough. That's all you need. So I'm going to place her back in the cage. And that was it. And every few days, I feed her a little bit of sugar water. Of course, she's been feeding on ripe bananas in the butterfly house as well. And another thing is that the females of this species, as you can see, they're a little bit more docile than the males. She doesn't freak out as much if I touch her, because females seem to be more lazy, even of this species, even though they fly a lot, have a very active lifestyle for a moth. But that's how I do it. Every few days I give her sugar water and I keep her in this small enclosure and this will guarantee that I can collect the eggs that she lays in captivity. Because in the big butterfly house she will scatter the eggs all around on the walls and the eggs are just too small to collect over there. So I like to make her lay eggs in a smaller enclosure. She's getting a bit older as you can see, I think she's already mated. She's a beautiful female, this is a really awesome species. I love the black witch. Look at that, such an awesome species. You can see on her wings that she's getting a bit older already. But that's fine. And I think after tonight we're gonna find many eggs in here. And tomorrow again I'm gonna feed her more sugar water. But she did drink a little, so that's a success.
Yep, males and females can be fed in captivity from a bottle cap containing fruit juice or sugar water. Honey water works too. They'll drink anything sugary as long as it's properly diluted. And that's how you do it. The cool thing about moths is they will tell you if they are hungry or not. All you have to do is you have to read their body language. If you roll out their tongue and you dip it in sugar water or fruit juice, and if the moth is really hungry, they will freeze. They will stop. And they, they won't roll up the tongue. Because the thing is, most moths, if you mess with their proboscis and you roll it out, their first instinct, their first reflex is to roll it back up. Unless she's hungry, then she's going to keep the tongue extended and just sit there, carefully, but passively she'll be drinking the sugar water. So that's cool about moths. Yes, even moths can be read, even moths can be understood if you pay attention to their body and the way they behave. And if you understand their behavior a little bit, I know they are not dogs, they are not cats, they don't have that much behavior, they don't play, they don't meow or bark, they don't want pats on the head, but they can tell you with their body language. Are they hungry? Do they want to mate? If you study moths and you look very closely and carefully, you can actually see what they want. And this is what helps me in breeding insects, I understand them. I can read their body language and I can see what it is that they need in captivity. Yeah. And uh, soon she'll be laying eggs in here, that's what I expect. Let's crack a beer. Just because we are one of the first to document the life cycle online. Kids, don't drink if you are under the age of 18 or 21, whatever the drinking age is in your country. Drinking is not cool, it doesn't make you tough, okay? I don't want to be a bad influence or promote alcohol, that's not what my channel is about. I don't drink that much, it's just a little celebration because I'm alone in the rainforest to the other side of the world. I have no friends, no family here, it's just me and the moths and I love it, I love it. We've been really successful. Thank you, Regwa, for having me here and working with the insects. In the future, we are going to raise many moths from this area. Let's move on. <clears throat> Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you've done it right, the female will produce fertile eggs and then you can repeat the whole cycle all over again. Let's take the camera. Boom. Right. Let's see. Aha. See, so these tiny things here, they are as small as a small grain of sand. These are the eggs. I don't know if you can even see it. It's this tiny gray thing on my hand. This is an egg. And that means that we did the whole life cycle. Now we just have to collect the eggs, place them here in a petri dish. Oh look, there's more eggs. There's dozens of eggs. They are so small for a moth this big, it's crazy, but they are here. It's working. Five days went by until I saw something move in the petri dishes. Here are the babies! We did it, boys! We did it! We completed the life cycle. I'm so happy. These babies, I'm probably gonna release back into the wild. Or I'm going to trade eggs with other breeders. Anyway, that's not important. My project is almost finished. And my flight to the Netherlands is just in a few days. So we finished just in time to film everything. But first we gotta release the moths before we go back to Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the end, with the life cycle completed of the Black Witch. My time in Brazil is running out, and in two days I am flying back home with the airplane back to my home country. But I came here for one mission, and I succeeded. I succeeded! There's only one thing left, we're going to release the Black Witches that we have raised back into nature. There's no point in keeping them here. I have to go back home now, is there? I 
I do have one request, guys. If you ever see a black witch moth in the wild, I want you to think about me. Because you never know if they could be my grand, 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 grandchildren. These moths can migrate large distances. They can migrate over countries and probably continents. So that means that the ones I will be releasing will probably spread themselves all over Brazil and their children and their children and their children and who knows where they will end up one day. I've raised all these moths from egg to adult and I'm really proud to be here. Hope you guys really enjoyed it. It's hard to say goodbye. I wish I could stay here so I could see the rest of their life. But there's no point in keeping something captive. If you love something, sometimes you need to let it go. This is it, folks. This is the end. This is the hardest part of being a mother. Saying goodbye. Bye, children. Go and prosper. Fly. Fly. Fly free. Show you, but I did have multiple females just before I left. We raised about a dozen of moths in total. Let's see, come on, guys, fly! Ah, there you go. Oh, look, it's flying down there. Can you even see it? Well, that's it. One more moth to release. The last female. Haha. <laughs> Thank you for watching Moth Cycles and we hope to see you again. Goodbye. Time to go home. One more thing. In my web series Moth Cycles I like to be educational. We don't just breed species for entertainment, we breed them for education. So at the end of every life cycle of butterfly and moth that I film in Moth Cycles I have one educational part. Let's start. The Black Witch. The Black Witch moth, Ascalafa odorata. There is a lot to say about this wonderful and intriguing species, especially after today. And there is still a lot more to discover about them, even after I uploaded this video. So let's have a quick, quick rundown of all the facts. Witch moths. What are witch moths? Most people know the black witch and the white witch, but in reality there are many more. It is a tribe of the Erebine named the Termesini, a group of moths exclusively found on the American continent. And they include the largest species of moths in the world, including the black witch moth for example. Interestingly, they are a severely neglected and severely understudied group of animals. The life cycle of the vast majority of species is completely unknown to science. Famously, they include the largest Lepidoptera, but also the largest flying insect in the world, Tessania agrippina, the white witch, another species of which the life cycle, of course, is unknown. The black witch moth has a surprisingly large distribution. It is a resident in the southern United States, Texas and Florida, found up to Mexico, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Argentina, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, Bolivia, Panama, all of the Caribbean, Suriname, French Guiana, Paraguay and Uruguay. Did I forget anyone? It's also recorded as a stray migrant, but not a resident, throughout most of the United States of America, even up to Canada. Important to remember is that this species needs a tropical or subtropical environment. They cannot handle cold temperatures very well, it is a thermophile. 
so their presence in northern latitudes is temporary. They are, however, amazingly talented migrants that can migrate from the southern United States and Mexico all the way up to New York and Canada, provided there is warm weather in summer. Their greatest weakness is cold temperatures. The food plants of this species are numerous, and many of them are in the legume family. They are very polyphagous on many species of Fabacea plants. This includes Caesar calpina, Robinia, Inga, Albizia, Gymnoclaris, Senna, Acacia, a very important host plant, Acacia, Pizzicellobium, Uncaria, Ebenopsis, and more. Some sources also mention a few non Fabacea plants. They are worth mentioning. Ficus or fig tree and also Diospiros are mentioned in literature. Hmm, interesting. The complete life cycle of this species up until recently and especially a high level description with good quality pictures and information of all the life stages was previously unknown. So I'm happy to announce I have finally done the documentation that is necessary to show the entire life cycle. This is definitely a highlight of my channel and I am pleased to make a tangible contribution to our knowledge of butterflies and moths. I care about insects and their conservation incredibly much. It is my reason to live, as crazy as that sounds, and it's the whole reason I started this channel and my career. I would like to thank everybody who has supported me throughout the years and of course Regua, their generosity was amazing. The caterpillars of this species are rarely seen in nature because they are so good at hiding themselves. During the day the caterpillars can almost hide underground, very close to the ground, in or near the roots of plants, but also in leaf litter and in cracks in tree bark. They can also hide near the canopy, compressing themselves tightly against branches. No wonder the complete life cycle was unrecorded. The small caterpillars are even harder to find and hide in the vegetation during the day. Possibly even in the canopy on the youngest shoots. Overall they are very well camouflaged creatures that live a very hidden lifestyle. It is no surprise the caterpillars are rarely photographed despite it being a common species. It is also no surprise the life cycle was unknown because these caterpillars are just so hard to find and document. The males and females are distinct and easy to identify because the females have a white creamy thick band that runs across their wings. It's very easy to notice. Can you see the difference? Males are more uniformly gray. And I also noticed that in captivity females have a significantly longer lifespan than the males, it seems. Perhaps it is the females that carry over the next generation when the season is unfavorable and have to wait for the next breeding season. Females can lay hundreds of eggs. The moths themselves are exclusively fruit feeding. In particular, rotting and fermenting fruit is what they really love. There are no reports of the moths coming to flowers, making them exclusive frugivores. So the presence of fruiting trees is important for the survival of this species. As you could see in this video, banana is one of their top favorites, but really they aren't picky. In South America, there are a lot of superstitions when it comes to this species. However, the cultures of South America and Central America should and cannot be generalized. But it seems that since the Aztec times, it is thought that if the moth enters a home where somebody is ill, the ailing person will pass. Black witch moths do have a reputation in folklore as a bad omen, and seeing one may mean that death is nearby. However, some cultures see them as signs of financial luck coming soon. Other cultures see them as the souls of dead relatives, visiting them from, visiting them from the afterworld. I wonder if any of my viewers are from a superstitious culture that has any beliefs about this moth. 
If so, please write it in the comments. I am interested in hearing your experience and your local beliefs. It seems that generally moths remind us of the importance of endings in the process of transformation. While we may fear its connection with death and endings, moths are also signs of rebirth. Its presence encourages us to trust the process of letting go so that we may move ahead. Another fun fact. The black witch moth pupa were placed in the mouths of victims of serial killer Buffalo Bill in the novel Silence of the Lambs. In the movie adaptation, they were replaced by death's head hog moth pupa. Interestingly, the name for this species also translates to witch in many indigenous languages. Many indigenous cultures are afraid of them. While these superstitions are interesting culture, I do hope everybody realizes that these insects are in reality beneficial and harmless. Wow guys, I am back in the Netherlands in my own home country. And I have to tell you, this was the most special episode of Moth Cycles that I ever made. And it was also the most professional one. You see, I don't know if you are a subscriber of my channel who has seen other episodes of the web series Moth Cycles. In each episode we raise one species of moth, from egg to adult moth, and see what happens. Usually I am doing this right here in the Netherlands, my home country. No, I'm not from Brazil, guys. A lot of people think that because I make a lot of videos in Brazil. They think I'm Brazilian. I'm Dutch. But... Usually I'm raising moths for fun and entertainment on YouTube, not for science, right? Uh, this was different. Like, first of all, I want to say thank you, Reserva Ecologica de Guapiazzo or Regua. Thank you so much for sponsoring me. Thank you for letting me stay for free in Regua. Um, basically, they were sponsoring me because for a scientist, it costs about $50 a day to use all the facilities in Regua. And I got it all for free because they believed in me and my talent. And believe me, guys, I will repay the favor. I will not only help to promote you guys on YouTube, but I'm going to make sure I will write a good article about this experience and make sure to give you guys all the scientific credit. But this episode was also so different because I was raising stuff in a laboratory with kind of institutional support. Almost like a real biologist, isn't it? That's new to me. I never felt so professional in my life. Having my own breeding space. That's, that was so amazing. And I just want to show you guys these are the kind of things that I am capable of if I get serious support, yeah? I've always said this to you on YouTube. If I have the budget, if I have the resources, if I have the means, I will show you the life cycles of the rarest moth species on Earth, the most unusual ones. Species nobody has raised before. And the thing is, I'm not trying to brag, be like, oh, Bart Coppens, he is so talented. It's more like, guys, look what we are capable of. Look at what we are capable of if people take my ideas seriously and invest in them, yo. I know I'm a silly guy. I'm that silly guy on YouTube who is obsessed with moths and insects. Oh, he's so cute. Look at Bart Coppens. But no, I have serious ideas and serious ambitions. And I hope people see that. Yeah, yeah. My, some of my videos are a bit silly or weird. I am naturally a little bit crazy. But below the surface, there is a ambitious biologist who really wants to contribute more information about insects. I am willing to travel the world to do this stuff. And it's, it could happen, right? It could happen based on how seriously people take me and how much they are willing to invest in me. Am I? Now, guys, I have some more good news for you because they liked me so much, I can return there in the future to research more species of moths in the rainforest in southeast Brazil. In fact, I'm already working on some secret projects in the laboratory. Let me show you some teasers of what I am developing. First, the giant silk moth Titea Tamerlan. Out. There are two species of moths that are very big and very common in Regua. Their names 
Artiteata Merlan and Disdaimonia Brasiliensis. You may have seen them before in my videos. Well, my idea is to do a breeding experiment. Can we breed them in captivity? Good news, I've already started doing some experiments with this species. And here's a little teaser trailer. But that's all that I'm going to show, because I'm not sure if, it go if it's going to happen. It depends on my time and resources. I also happen to find an interesting lapid moth. The larvae are known to science, but the complete life cycle is still not, still not completely known. Let me show you. One species of lapid moth that was very common in the area was Tolipa proxima, and this unusual species of lapid moth with a tiger print pattern proved to be rather easy to raise in captivity. And their complete life cycle seems unknown to science, although larvae have been recorded before. It's kind of like the same situation as the black witch moths. Now I'm already working on a small science project that involves rearing them in captivity. Will there be a video? Maybe. If I have the time and resources to do it, consider supporting my channel if you want to see this happen. Another thing that I've always wondered, is it possible to breed those giant, weird and crazy species of hog moths that you see in the tropical rainforest? Well, let me show you the species and let me show you some of the limited success that I've had with them. Brazil is rich in hog moths and this is no lie. In fact, there are over 200 species of hog moths in Brazil. And in Aragua, we recorded over 80 species of hog moths so far. The diversity is crazy high, but the real question, the real elephant in the room is, is it possible to breed tropical hog moths in captivity? Now, some people have asked me, Bart, are we ever going to see the life cycles of giant hog moths from the South American rainforest on YouTube? My answer to that is yes, yes we are, ladies and gentlemen, because I am slowly cracking the code on how to breed tropical South American hog moths. If you don't believe me, oh, here's some of the results that I'm getting. Ooh, what are these? What species of hog moth is this, ladies and gentlemen? Aren't you curious? Look at these giant larvae that I've been raising. It looks like I have cracked the code to rearing hog moths from the rainforest. I have a special trick up my sleeve to make them lay eggs and how to raise the larva. But before we continue... Oh, that's right. If you didn't have any reason to support my channel before, now you do. Especially if you like hog moths. It's the donations of my viewers that allow me to experiment with different species and obtain the necessary equipment that I need to do so. There's also some miscellaneous stuff that I am trying to raise in the laboratory and trying to complete their life cycles of. And if I'm successful, maybe there's going to be videos of the life cycles of these insects on YouTube. Let me give you a little teaser just to tickle your imagination. Ooh. And that is not all. I'm working behind the scenes to make more experiments. I'm raising numerous insects in the laboratory. But all of this takes an overwhelming amount of time and effort. There are thousands of butterflies and moths that no one has really reared before in captivity. But figuring out their life cycle is very difficult, complicated and time consuming work. This work however does benefit their conservation. After all, if you want to protect something, you need to know what it eats in the first place. Ironically, the plants that some species use to complete the life cycle and their development have not been recorded to science before. We need more dedicated and talented people out there who are committed to breeding moths and writing down the food plant. In fact, there are not many people out there doing this kind of work, simply because no one cares about moths. I know that is disappointing to hear, but that is why I made this channel. My plan is to make this channel into an educational library of videos that is supported by the people themselves. If people have my back, I will have yours and produce the highest quality entertainment and educational insect videos. And on top, we will be making contributions to science together. The potential here is massive. If people have my back. So yeah. This video is the start of something new, you can imagine. However, there is the elephant in the room 
that we need to address right now. And the elephant in the room is the same thing that I mentioned in most of my videos. And that is that my YouTube channel is demonetized by YouTube. What does that mean? It means that if I upload a video like this one that I've been working on for a long time, I don't make any money from the views. In fact, my whole channel, yeah, my channel is about eight years of content, yeah? I've been making videos for eight years. And in those eight years, I made about one and a half thousand insect videos. I put them all up for free. And those one and a half thousand videos are not short videos. Some of them are over an hour long, like this one. It takes me an, a tremendous amount of time and effort to make these videos, to edit them, to film them, to write them. It is work that I'm constantly doing. And it's a problem because I don't make money from YouTube. YouTube is not supporting me. And they refuse to tell me why. I send them many emails like, YouTube, why have you demonetized my channel? Because normal YouTubers, they make money if you get a lot of viewers and subscribers. You make money from the views through ad revenue, but my channel is permanently demonetized. And for me, this is, it is an issue that I need to address. So I want to end the show by saying, guys, if you like what I do, yeah, if you enjoy this kind of stuff and you want to see more of it, please consider donating, tipping, or buying a subscription on Patreon, my crowdfunding platform. Because the only income, the only money I make from YouTube are the donations from my fans and my viewers, okay? All my free time that I spend on this channel, all the equipment, all the cameras, all that stuff is crowdfunded by you. Now, of course, I don't want to be an entitled e-beggar, you know? There's a lot of people who have YouTube channels or Twitch channels that beg. And I guess I fell into that category. But the thing is, there's more behind it than just the surface. First of all, I would never feel entitled to anybody's contributions, right? I know there's an economical recession. Some people cannot afford to pay rent or food. So please take care of yourself first before you take care of others, okay? I'm not asking it out of pity, but because there is an ideology behind my channel, there is an idea behind it. And the idea is doing things like these, the things that you just saw today on camera. Because it would not be possible for me to do these kind of things without asking people for help. So that means, yes, I need to crowdfund my content. I need to crowdfund all the time and effort that I put into these videos. Of course, I would never expect it or be entitled to it, guys. I just want to get it out of the way because it feels bad. It feels bad to bring this stuff up in every video. It's, it's annoying, it's kind of... It's, it's jarring sometimes. But at the same time, I need to make a difficult moral choice here because I really enjoy making videos for you on YouTube. I really enjoy making videos about insects. I love it, it's my passion. And a difficult moral choice is, do I continue to do this, but also ask people for donations? Or do I stop asking people for donations and just ignore it? But it also means I'm not going to be able to make a lot of videos. Because you have to understand, guys, my background is, I started out as a kid on YouTube who was enthusiastic about moths and started talking about it. And over time it has grown into a big channel and people started taking me seriously and involving me in projects like these. And while I used to be a hobbyist, I'm starting to feel more professional nowadays. I, I get to go to Brazil to a natural reserve to document the life cycle of an insect that very few people have ever documented. I'm starting to be People want to involve me a little bit in science, so slowly I'm evolving from a hobbyist to more of a biologist. And the thing is that I can only, I can only make that growth, I can only make that growth if I think about making it sustainable, I guess. And I do want to say all the funds I raise online, I use them for the production of more videos 
to fund my research, to fund my experiments, and to keep this channel alive and growing. Because it, it really is you, it is you, it really is the community that feeds the monster that is Bart Coppens, if you think about it. The only way I can keep up this lavish lifestyle of playing with moths all day is because people have my back financially, otherwise it would not be possible or sustainable. The only way I would ever consider making this my full-time job and thinking like, okay, I'm gonna raise moths full-time for YouTube. The only way that's ever going to happen is if the community has my back, of course. And I jokingly called it a lavish lifestyle, like people on YouTube, my fans are, are funding my lavish lifestyle of playing with insects. I'm calling it lavish because there's no economical value in it, right? Like if you learn to play, play, play music really well, you can, you can sell the music, right? If you are a good programmer or a car mechanic, you can get a job. You can repair people's cars and make money. But if you're a moth breeder, what can you do? What are your options? Yeah, my talent is breeding insects. Um, who cares? There's no monetary value in it. But I do think there's a lot of ideological value in it. In a world where biodiversity is declining, right? Where species are going extinct, the earth is warming, ecosystems are changing, and yet there are still a lot of insects out there that are very important for the environment, very important for the ecosystem, and there are no people looking at them, there are no people studying them, no people documenting them. And that's, that's ironic because insects are so important for the environment. And that's why I call it a lavish lifestyle. But I also think it's, I see the value in it, you know. I see the value in people who can afford themselves to have the free time to use their talent and knowledge to the best of the ability that helps the environment, that basically produces more knowledge yeah it furthers our knowledge of insects and the things that we really know about them i think that's a very noble goal i don't really think it's a lavish lifestyle i think it's hard work it's research it's it's also practical you know raising these insects it's not easy especially if you're under pressure because a lot of people invested in you they paid for your trip they gave you a laboratory to raise the insects you need to succeed you need to be successful. You need to use all your talent and skills. But at the same time, economically, it's so hard to fund things like this. And I, my idea was like, okay, maybe I can build an idea. Maybe I can build a community. Maybe I can gather the support of people who think like me, who have my back, who are like, Bart, I like your research. I like the things that you do. And maybe I've been a little bit stupid and maybe I've been a little bit naive. But in my opinion, in a world where insects are so important for the environment, where insects are going extinct, where they are declining, butterflies, moths, beetles, dragonflies, you name it, pretty much almost all the groups of insects are declining, becoming endangered, going extinct. So if you really, really, really think about it, my dream has always been funding research projects like this one, you know? but with the support of the community, because the community genuinely cares about insects. They genuinely enjoy seeing videos about them. They generally enjoy learning about them. And this video is kind of the culmination of that idea. This video has confirmed my delusion that it's actually possible. Like if people have my back, if people support me, I can bring results. I can bring cool and unique stuff. So my confidence is restored. Thank you guys for watching. Last but not least, everybody can join Regua. We are looking for volunteers to raise moths for research in Brazil. If you are interested in rearing moths in captivity the way I do on YouTube, send us an email. We take researchers, students, tourists and volunteers. I'll display the email addresses. Wow. Last but not least, in conclusion, did you like the video? If you did, consider making a financial contribution to my channel. Not mandatory. I have to bring it up. I'm sorry. It's cringy. It's annoying. Consider it. And if you don't, it doesn't make you any less of a viewer. All of you are super appreciated. Liking my videos, commenting on them, sharing them. 
It's only because of you, because of all of you, every person who clicked on my videos, that this project was possible. And I am forever grateful for it, guys. I really am. Ah. So let's play the credits. The credits will be a compilation of my time in Brazil. And displaying the names of all the people who have a subscription to my Patreon account, the people who help me crowdfund these kind of projects and this kind of content. See you guys next time. This was Bart Gomez with the Black Witch. Oh. Thank you for watching this super special episode of Moth Cycles. The one thing that I've learned on YouTube the past few years is that everybody can make a difference. Even this silly Mothman that people thought was a weirdo, and they're right, I am a weirdo, I am a massive weirdo. But even I managed to make a difference in the end. So don't be discouraged. That's the cool thing about nature. If you're really interested in learning about nature, if you really do your best to observe it and look at it and try to perceive and understand what's going on, if you try to dissect all the components and put them together, then you, you too, will be able to make a contribution. We need more people to be interested in nature. And I really believe that every person, as long as your interest is coming from a good place in your heart, can make a difference for nature, no matter how silly you are. At first, they ignore you, and then they laugh at you, and then they fight you, and then you win. <laughs>